just for loving us enough to send your son to die for our sin. God, we just want to thank you for the opportunity today for the service. Uh, being a little extra special with uh, the ordination of Brother Ray. I just ask that you would be with him and his family as he dedicates himself uh, to your service through this church, Lord. But I pray that you'd help us all to remember that we each do a part, a special part to minister in this in this place, in this community, and we all have an important part to play, Lord. Just help us to do that. Lead and guide and direct us today and throughout the week in our individual lives, Lord. May we always honor you, Lord, and that we don't take our freedom for granted to do just anything we please, but that we do everything to please you. And uh, we just want to give you glory with our lives, God, because you sacrificed everything to give us the freedom that we enjoy as Christians and as we enjoy as Americans, Lord. But we're at a different level of freedom, Lord, as Christians, and we thank you so much for that extra privilege, but also that extra responsibility. May we accept it with much trepidation and much seriousness as we think about how we influence others. We thank you for our Sunday school class this morning, Brother Chuck, and every Sunday school teacher, every deacon, every church leader, every person who serves here, whether it be the nursery, or the youth, or anything, Lord, all the way to, to those uh, at the end of their lives, Lord. May we be able to minister to all people in ways that you have gifted us all individually with, Lord. And may we just give you honor and praise and glory, and may Jesus Christ and the Father, Son, Holy Spirit be praised in our country and in our service and in our lives. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. everybody stand your feet and I think the folks in this Independence Day maybe we together honor our nation and say the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. So if you would, let's all put our attention to the flag and let's say it together. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. You know, it's because of that freedom. Sometimes we forget, but for all the gifts that we enjoy as a nation, freedom, the liberty, the equality that's so present, let us not forget it was all made possible many hundreds of thousands of years ago because of the cross of Calvary. The first cause us sacrifice for our Savior. Let's open up our circle together, sing this chorus together. Let's call it the Pledge of Allegiance to the Lamb. Would you sing it with us together?
Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. We'll continue in worship. We're going to sing our nation's national anthem. What an appropriate time. Let's sing together. Number 338, how firm a foundation. Aren't you glad in faith? Aren't you happy because of freedoms that our forefathers, our church fathers gave us an establishment, an idea of coming together for the express purpose of worshiping and giving praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why we're here because we have an example of those before us. And we sing and we celebrate on a special day like today. Let's sing verse 1 and 4. How firm a foundation we say. Go ahead and play it, gentlemen. We've sung this before, but what power, what opportunity to acknowledge our Lord on that beautiful cross. Let's sing this song together.
Apostle Paul said, For the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. displayed and for a love given. Thank you, Lord, for that freedom we have because of that death. Thank you, Lord, for that power, so magnificent, so displayed, Lord. And sometimes, God, we lose that wonder. We lose that significance, God, in our life. Lord, bring that back today, would you? Bring that, Lord, to our forefront of our minds and our hearts as we reconcile the fact that we're no longer under bondage. We're let loose, Lord. We're set free because of Calvary. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Would you anoint our pastor, Lord? Would you get behind him and in him and through him, God, and impress upon him the words that we need to hear today? 
change us, Lord. Affect us. And Lord, keep knocking at the door. Let our hearts open, God, to receive and respond to you today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen and amen. If you've got a copy of God's Word this morning, I'm going to ask you to go to Nehemiah chapter number 4. Nehemiah chapter number 4. My boss just told me we got children's church this morning, so we're going to dismiss the little ones for children's church. Thank you, praise team, for leading us this morning. Nehemiah chapter number 4. Once you find your place, I'm going to ask you to stand with me in the reverence of reading God's Word and follow along with me, beginning in verse number 7. The Bible says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashadites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored, and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they will, neither, nor, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into the midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came, they told us ten times, for whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall, at the openings, and I set up the people according to their families, with swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the noble, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Lord, it is because of who you are, the power that was displayed on that cross, Lord, that you have blessed us to live in perhaps one of the greatest nations that has ever existed. The Father, all is in vain unless we feel your presence and we know you're near. Lord, we need your guidance. Lord, I need your guidance this morning. Father, I ask now, best I know how, Lord, that you will just use me, that you will forgive me of any sin, that you will just open me up, overflow me with your words, and let those spill out the things that each and every person here this morning needs to hear. Lord, you take control of the service, and Lord, may your will be done. And in the end, may we be able to leave her day since it's been good to be in your house. Father, we ask now for you to work in a mighty way. May the Holy Spirit show up and speak to each and every one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Nearly two and a half centuries ago, 56 men put their reputation on the line when they decided to sign a document that they thought it was worth fighting for. Most of you probably understand and know what I'm talking about, especially in this time of the season. That, that document was the Declaration of Independence. And while most of the world saw what was taking place perhaps as a fight for freedom, or maybe even a fight for religious freedom, I want to contend to you this morning that it, those two things probably were so to some extent, but I believe that the greatest fight was for something that's worth fighting for. I believe the greatest fight is something that's still worth fighting for today, and that is a fight for our families. These men stepped out knowing what they were doing could eventually cost them their lives, but it was their families that made them sign this Declaration of Independence. And can I tell you that I believe the family is under attack like no other time in American history. The family is under attack and we see it in the lack of morality that is being constantly displayed. Even in the past two or three weeks when we've watched the news and the Supreme Court rulings and things that are taking place, there is a division even amongst families in this great land of ours. And what is absolutely amazing to me is looking at those who are part of the family of God that are so divided on such an issue that we have stood for more than 50 years. And that issue is simply this, life is sacred. Life is important. Life is what God starts. It's what He begins. He begins it inside of the womb, and I'm going to say this to us this morning, life is worth fighting for. Yet sometimes we see what's taking place and we think to ourselves, Man, can it get any worse? 
Why are these things happening? I want to say this to you this morning. I believe the return of Jesus Christ is very near. And if we believe that this morning, we need to take to heart what Paul told Timothy. He said, know this, that in the last day perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Can I say to you, when I look at what's going on in society today, these things are prevalent. These things are what is, div the, the, is dividing our families. And I need to ask a question to us this morning. Do we really believe today that our families are still worth fighting for? If we do, it's time for us to say we, are need to, we need to be willing to stand up. We need to be willing to lay our lives on the line if necessary, just like those 56 men did back in 1776. How can anyone not see what's taking place around us and all the evil that seems to just kind of permeate through society? You turn on the news anymore and it's one evil act after the next that we're beginning to see. It's children divided against parents. It's brothers against sisters. It's moms against dads. It's families that are being ripped apart. And what we need to consider is what are we willing to do individually in order to fight back? I need to also say this. When we look out there and we think to ourselves, this is bad. Understand this. Evil has existed even before the creation of humanity. Satan has always ran rampant. Satan has always been abounding, trying to tear down what was God was trying to build up. And even here in the book of Nehemiah, we start to see those, that evil was in existence even then families and people where have been destroyed. Nehemiah looks out and he's heartbroken. He's thinking to himself, somebody has to do something. How many of us ever thought to ourselves when we look around at certain situations, it doesn't matter what it is, but we see certain things and we think to ourselves, somebody has to do something. Can I ask you a question this morning? Why can't that somebody sometimes be us? Why can it not be me? Why can I not say, I need to, to fight back and do what needs to be done? Here is Nehemiah. He's looking out and he's seeing these families being destroyed. And it breaks his heart. He hits his knees. He begins to pray. He says, Lord, somebody needs to do something. And I believe God said, Nehemiah, that somebody is you. And God began to give him a vision about building and rebuilding walls in order to protect these families. Church, I want to say this to us this morning. We must be willing to fight to secure a hope, not just for ourselves, but for our children and our children's children and those that come after us. And if we're going to start fighting, we've got to fight for what really matters. And I believe there's a whole lot of things in this country that's worth fighting for, but I want to say this this morning. I believe the family is worth fighting for. I believe it's time we stand up and say what needs to be said. I believe the value of the local church is still of importance, even in this evil world. And I want to say this to us. You need to understand this. God ordained the family long before He ever ordained the church. And sometimes we mess up in our thought process here. See, you go back to, to, the, to the beginning, to creation, to, to the Garden of Eden. It was there that God looked at Adam and Eve and said, I have a plan for you. I want you to go out. I want you to procreate. I want you to fill this earth. And with your families, I want those families to continue to go. I want them to grow and I want them to grow strong. But then the devil began to show up. And the devil began to divide. Preacher, do you absolutely believe that? Yes, I do. All the way back in the book of Genesis, two brothers, Cain and Abel. And the devil knew exactly what he needed to do to bust that family up. And he planted evil thoughts inside of one of those brothers to kill the other brother. Church, listen to me. Even today, Satan is still in the deception business. And many of the times we are accepting a mistruth. We think to ourselves, and I want you to hear my heart this morning, we think to ourselves that the job of training our children belongs to someone else. Hear me. 
the job of training your children belongs to mothers and fathers. It belongs inside the family. You think to yourself, well, I bring my kids to church. No, the church is here to help support your family. It's your responsibility to teach your children about the things of God. You send your children to school and you say, it's the teacher's responsibility to teach my children. No, it is your responsibility to teach them and make sure these teachers are teaching what you want your children to know. That's why I contend it's time for us to, to stand up, to rise up and realize what is taking place all around us. Our families, our children are becoming the victims in the battle. And consider what this generation is battling. Do you realize that crime amongst our youth is almost out of control? And the reason I believe that crime is out of control stems from how families have been broken up. How many mothers are working trying to take care of the home while there's not a father figure anywhere to be found? How many mothers are working multiple jobs just trying to, to make ends meet? You look at young adults today, they don't see the value in marriage. We're being told that alternative lifestyles are the right thing. This is not what God ever intended. He had a plan for us, and yet the walls of family are being breached every time we turn around. Our politicians are spewing hatred. The national debt is out of control. And do you realize your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, the debt that they are having to carry right now? The things that are going to ultimately have to come to an end, and we don't realize what the devil is doing. we got children today that are afraid to go to school because they're afraid of violence that's happening not only outside the doors of their school buildings, but sometimes now inside the doors of their school buildings. They're tore up, and they're looking for a way of escape. And if we don't stand up and teach them, they're going to find something that's going to just destroy their life. It could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be sex. They're being taught all of these things by society. These are nothing more than vices that will never give them what they need. And in the process, as families are being ripped apart. And the question remains is, do we, like Nehemiah, say it's time somebody does something? And Lord, if that's me, let it be me. I, I don't want to lose my family. I want to stand up and fight for what's worth fighting for and I'm burdened to see what's taking place all around our country and I want to say this to us this morning if we're going to rebuild some walls it starts by first accepting we must learn to fight our own spiritual battles first listen to the advice that Paul gives Timothy in first Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16 he says take heed to yourself and to the doctrine continue in them for in doing this you will save both yourself and and those who hear you in this nation the devil has got us to a place where we have accepted a concept that's known as determinism let me explain that to you in case you don't know determinism is when something goes wrong in your life it's always somebody else's fault it's what somebody else has done wrong with you it's denying personal responsibility in what goes wrong. You see, it's easy to blame someone else. Think about what happens in our world today. Our children come home from school. They don't study. They're on their video games or on their phones or running the internet. They don't do any of these things. And then when the report card comes home and nobody has worked with them, why is my children failing in school? And what the first thing that most parents today want to do is the teacher's fault. I'm going to say something to you that's going to surprise you. You're absolutely right. But it's not the teacher down at the school, it's the teachers in the house. We have to get back to teaching them. We have to accept responsibility. When people rob and steal and even murder, he said, it's not their fault. It's the society that they grew up in. They were in the wrong environment. They weren't given the right tools. Where is mom and dad in the midst of all that? When we look at the prison population, and are overcrowded. We're advocating, let these criminals out. And this is what we hear propagated to us. They haven't been given a chance to succeed. Let me say this to you this morning. I wholly disagree. The truth is this. The Lord has given each of us a chance to succeed because He laid out the plan. He had a plan for the family. He knew what needed to be done. That's why Paul says, take heed to yourself. I was talking to someone not long ago. You know, when I grew up and did something wrong, I wasn't concerned about getting in trouble with the people at the school. 
I wasn't probably even concerned about getting in, in, in trouble with the law. I was worried about getting in trouble with mom and dad. That's what worried me. There were several times when I was in school, I went to the principal's office and he said, do I need to call you? Oh no, you don't need to call my parents. Let's just handle this right here, right now. See, God set up the family because He knew what we needed. God is the ultimate rule maker. It's not our Senate. It's not our Congress. It's not the White House. It's not even the Supreme Court. It's the Supreme Court of all. And Jesus Christ is the one who sits on the throne there. That's why Romans tells us this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are the one slave whom you obey? Whether it's sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that through you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart the, the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Let me say this to us this morning. If Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, if we know Him, if we claim Him, He's the one that our allegiance belongs to. We sang that, this morning, that song this morning about, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. That is our first and foremost allegiance. I am proud to be an American, but I'm even more proud to be a Christian. And that's where we have to stand on. So how do we start fighting this fight the right way? Well, I believe it begins when we fight with a proper focus. You see, Nehemiah saw the walls. He knew why the walls were down. He knew what needed to be done. He saw the need for protection and for families. He was even willing to risk his own life when he went in as the cupbearer before the king and said, King, I need to do something. As he begins to talk to the king, the king says, I'm going to allow this to happen. You see, he put his life on the line, figuring what he saw was worth the cost. And I say this to us today. Sometimes we're not willing to count the cost. Sometimes we're more concerned about the outcome. Men, listen to me. We need to be willing to become kingdom men. Our families are failing. Our churches are struggling. Our society are dying. And our men sometimes are standing back rather than standing up. You know, there was a time in this nation where men were willing to be men and to fight for what needed to be fought for. And I believe we need to get that proper focus in place where we're willing to do it again. Secondly, I tell us we need to fight with a persistent faithfulness. There used to be a generation that said, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Look back at the history of this great nation. Think about the men who were willing to put their life on the line and storm the beaches in order to protect their families that were back home. These were men that were willing to fight to the end. And they knew how to fight the enemy. They were willing to take them on, however it, whatever it took. If we're going to fight our spiritual enemy, we're going to fight Satan, we must equip ourselves, and we must equip ourselves daily. That's why Paul told Timothy to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. If we are not equipping ourselves properly each and every day, how can we defend our families? The Bible is our weapon. It is our spiritual tool. And if we're laying it down, we're, we're disarming ourselves, and we're giving in to the enemy. So we need persistent faithfulness in the word. We need to be to you taught the word if we're going to rebuild the walls to protect those around us that we love most. There also needs to be a persistent faithfulness in our church attendance. If we're not in the word teaching our children and families at home, it's going to play out in how we come to church. Many ask, where are our young families at today, today in regards to church? Well, can I tell you, the church doesn't happen inside these walls. They first happen inside the walls of your home. It's teaching them and showing them that God loves them and that God has a plan for them. Secondly, I want to say this to us this morning. We must determine we are willing to fight the enemy and enemies of our family. Look at verse 14 with me again. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. In other words, fight for your families. It's true that Satan is our greatest enemy. But do you realize this? Satan sometimes uses the greatest tools that we own against us. Preacher, what are you talking about? First of all, I want you to think about this, anger. 
You see, anger does more damage inside of our families than most of us ever want to take notice of. And that's why Paul gave us a warning. He says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this right. Honor your fathers and your mothers, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. He said, teach them what God is all about. Teach them what salvation is all about. Teach them about heaven. Put them on the path that they need to be. When they make a mistake, have a heart of forgiveness. Yes, it's easy to become angry, but don't let your anger overflow. Teach them the right way. Consider my next statement right here. When we look at the youth that's in this world today, how angry do they really look? They're looking for answers. They're looking for truth. And this anger is just kind of overflowing. But where did they learn that anger at? Could it have been inside the walls of our own homes? Has the devil breached our homes in such a way that he's using our own emotions to do destructive work? Not only is there anger, but sometimes there's apathy. Apathy is not only destroying churches, it's destroying our homes as well. As we talked about, that determinism concept is taking over. We don't want to assume responsibility. And what we have, if we're not careful, is a generation that's ready to wave the white flag of surrender. Saying, I, I give up. I can't do this anymore. I believe that apathy is a sin. And I want you to hear what the Lord commands His people. Over in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, the Lord was speaking to His children, His nation. And He said, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Notice that. It needs to be in your heart first. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Do you realize every single day we have the opportunity to communicate with our children just how wonderful and awesome the God we serve really is? Now does that mean that the world is going to get any better? No. Does it mean that life's going to get any easier? No. But it does, it does remember that we need to remember, remember this. I've got the Elmer Fudd syndrome going on this morning. We need to remember this. God is there with us every step of the way. He promises us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. Every day we need to be teaching our children and our grandchildren before we allow this apathy to set in. And if we're not praying for them consistently, day after day, then understand what I'm going to say next. We've already allowed apathy to set in. If we're not serving in His kingdom, in His church, and teaching our children the value and importance of serving our Lord and Master, we've already allowed apathy to set in. See, the devil can use anger, the devil can use apathy, but the devil can also use absenteeism. Our families do not need a television, they don't need the internet, they don't need social media, they don't need their friends teaching them what they need is God's plan inside of our families. And that we're teaching them and training them the right way. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, being tender-hearted, being courteous. You ever stop to consider why young adults today don't see a necessity in marriage? Could it be that they have never really experienced what true marriage in God's eyes should look like? Men, we need to be loving our families the way God wants us to. We cannot allow Satan to invade inside of our families. I look at young girls today, and they so desperately are seeking love, but not the way God designed it. You see, love is meant to fill a need. And a lot of what we think of as love today is nothing more than a moment. And we need to understand God had a desire in place for families. Today we've got parents that are so involved and trying to provide stuff for their families that they're absent and that they're missing out. And I know how easy this is because I was once one of those parents. 
90 to 100 hours a week working away from home, not realizing that stuff doesn't take the place of what God wants to be. We need to be there in the moment that they need us most. And if you look around today and see what's taking place with most of our children out running the streets trying to figure out what life's all about, they don't need stuff. They need moms and dads that love them. They need grandparents and aunts and uncles that know love them. And we need the family now more than ever. Finally, I believe that we must be willing and be determined that we're willing to fight for what matters most. You see, we think to ourselves, how, how do we battle? How do we take on this enemy, Satan? Now, if you've been in church, if you've been in your Bibles, you know this, that next to Jesus Christ, Satan is the second most powerful individual in all of creation. But stay with me here. While that may be a daunting thought, our God is still in control. And if we want to fight the enemy, we have to start by utilizing the tools that He's given us. And the first one happens when we hit our knees. The Bible tells us over in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their lands. I, I, I love sometimes to hear children pray. And when they get there, they just kind of open up and, and they say whatever's on their hearts. And do you know when we become adults, sometimes we get to a place that I think the devil gets in our heads and tells us that there's an art to pray. It's not an art to pray. God just wants us to have a communication with Him. And I know sometimes like today, Sonia's back working with some of these, these little ones that are here that she'll get there and sometimes they start praying and she comes and she tells me the things that they've been praying for and I, and I, and I comically start to laugh. I believe sometimes those things, as sweet and as innocent as they are, you see their true heart. And I believe when we get down on our knees and we start praying, we just need to open up like children and say, Lord, this is the problems I have. Lord, th these are the battles inside of my home. Lord, I, I need you. Can you help me? But now listen to what I'm going to say next. It's one thing to get alone in private prayer, but sometimes it's great to get alone with your family in, in corporate prayer. And teach these children, teach your wives, how, how, men, how, to, how to pray and how to look to the Lord. We need to learn how to pray. Bring them to church like when on Sunday mornings when we have our corporate prayer. Bring them in here. Teach them. Prayer is a necessity inside of our lives. It also tell us that we need to get involved in our communities. Do you know what your do you know who your children's friends are? Do you know their families? Do you know what's going on when they when they go out? Do you know who they're hanging around with? Do you know what's going on? Do you know what's being taught in the in your schools? Don't ever assume that someone else is taking care of your children the way they need to be taken care of. Don't ever assume that they are teaching them the right things. Because the devil is very deceptive. And he knows how to put people that may seem good and that sometimes that you may want to trust in their path. You need to know what's, what's going on. And the only way you can do is involve yourself in your community, in their lives, in the things that are going on. You need to have a willingness to become intentional in the Great Commission. The Great Commission doesn't necessarily start in the community. The Great Commission should always start inside of our families. I want to say this to us this morning. I want to see every single person I know one day in heaven with me. But I also know according to Scripture that that is not going to be a reality. But I also should have even a greater desire to know that everyone inside of my family is going to be in heaven with me. My children, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, everyone along the way. And if we're going to start the Great Commission, let's start with the souls of the family that matters most to us. Start sharing the gospel with your family. Let that wall be built in and around your homes and your families, first and foremost. And then, as I said earlier, promote the church as a place of importance. The church is designed to support you. The church was designed to support your family. Bring your families to church. Let them hear the Word of God. Let them learn how to praise Him. Let them hear the message. 
So here's what I want you to take away this morning. My desire in this message, message is simply this. That we understand this, that we're in a battle. And the battle lines have to start inside of our homes. We have to have the same desires today as Nehemiah had. Look with me there at the last part of verse 14, Nehemiah chapter 4. And fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses, your homes, your family. Are we fighting for our families today? Or have we surrendered to the enemy? This morning I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to make a renewed commitment. Some of our children have gone astray, and what some of us need to do is build some walls around them. How do we do that? It starts on our knees. It starts with the one who gives us the vision of knowing how to build that wall, just like me and my guy. Some of us have homes that look like constant battlefields. And if we want the battle to cease, if we want to see peace inside of our homes, on our knees before the Lord. I mean, a lot of us are missing from battle. It's time to re-engage. We need to show our families that we love them enough that man, we're willing to fight for them. And you may be sitting there going, well, well, preacher, how do I do that? It starts on our knees. Looking to the God that we love and say, Lord, help us to build some walls. I, I believe that walls are built with prayer. And I believe that Nehemiah had that brokenness about him and, and he realized that. I, I want you to look back with me in Nehemiah chapter 1 just for a second. And look with me in verses 3 and 4. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And they said to me, the survivors who were left from the captivity in the providence are there in great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem broke, is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words that I, talking about Nehemiah, sat down and wept and mourned for many days. And I, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You see, before Nehemiah ever picked up the first stone, the first rock, before he started looking to these people saying, we need to rebuild these walls, he first realized the importance bowing before the one who was going to help those walls to go up. He began to realize, I need to get before the Lord and allow Him to show me how this needs to be done. Church, I want to say this to us this morning. I believe there's some walls that we need to rebuild. I believe the family is worth fighting for. And there's not a doubt in my mind with every single one of us sitting here this morning that our children our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, the generations to come behind us, that every single one of us believes they're worth it. And if we believe there's worth, they're worth it, then we have to come to this place in life. It's time that we quit saying somebody needs to do something. And we start saying this, Lord, here am I. Send me. Let that someone begin and maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're saying to yourself, I don't know where to start. Let me let you in on this. That's okay. Because God does. He'll give us the vision. He'll tell us what we need if we're only going to do that. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and your Savior. Can I say this to you? He wants to make you a part of His family. And all you need to do is be willing to come to Him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. And this is what He'll say to us. It's okay. I've got the answers for that as well. You just need to be willing to step out and follow me. Your family is worth fighting for. And I'll show you how to build those walls if you only come. This morning, I want to challenge you. What are you doing yourself to protect your family? If you say, I love my family. They're worth fighting for. Then maybe today you start by saying, Lord, help me. Show me and help me build the walls that you will build. Let's all stand to our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning as the pianist comes.
I'm going to give you an opportunity just for a second to stop and think. What does your family look like? What does your family need? Where are your children at today? I'm not talking about maybe they're here with you, but I'm talking about where are they at in life? Moms, dads, how involved are you in their lives? I'm going to tell you this as a parent of a 32-year-old. They grow up way too fast. And they're gone way too fast. But that doesn't mean we ever stop praying for them and teaching them. This morning, right where you're at, or maybe right here at this altar, you might need to come. You may need to fall down. You may say, Lord, help me. Help me to build some walls to protect the family. If you're here this morning, you know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to challenge you to step out. Let me introduce you to the man that can change your entire world. Father, the best I know how now, I've said everything that you told me to say. Lord, we commend this invitation into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a place of quiet rest.
God equips each of us to serve hand in hand, arm in arm, to accomplish what he wants in his kingdom. Every child of God is called to grow in their faith and to serve others living out their faith. That's the example that Jesus gave not only to the apostles, not only am I giving to our biggest to Ray and Eve, but to each and every one of us. So this morning, I'm going to ask all of our ordained men in the church, if you've been ordained, I want you to come. I want you to lay your hands upon this couple. You can come on right now. And as I lead us in prayer here in just a moment, I'm going to ask each of these men to pray over this couple and to pray specifically that the Lord helps them to fight for what matters most, their family this family. Let's pray. Father, as we stand before you today, 
how blessed we are to have Ray and Eden as a part of this church family. We are thankful for the willingness to show servant leadership. And Lord, I pray for the protection on their family as they fight the enemy. I pray for your blessings upon their lives, especially during the seasons of difficulty that the enemy sends their way. I pray that you give them wisdom in the moments of decision making. And that the Lord will implant in them a desire to serve like never before. Lord, I ask that you give this couple the ability to do this job and to do it well. And most of all, I ask that you remove the fears of inadequacy that the devil often sends our way when we decide to follow and serve you. Lord, in their spirit of humility, I ask that you give them a spirit of forgiveness, a heart of purity. And through that purity in serving you and others, may they discover the greatest joy that can ever be found. And that comes from knowing you and following you daily. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, and most importantly, our Lord and Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. This morning, at the conclusion of service, I want you to go to this family. I want you to love on them. I want you to tell them you appreciate them. Tell them how special they are to us. And I want you to promise them that you'll be praying for them, not just now, but the days to come as well. Brother Bradley, you come and catch us up on the announcements. Don't get worried. I'm not going to try to sing. Uh, sir? I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, well, let's get wrong with it. Uh, no, it's been something on my heart for a long time, I want to say. Uh, I was born and raised in Nashville. Uh, I lived, uh, I don't know, South Nashville, moved to the Garland in 1953. Uh, it's been a blessing to be a part of the Garda community. My great great grandmother was a Bates. A lot of you people here are kin and know about the Bateses, and uh, they played a big part in the Garda. And over the years, uh, Brother, Brother Jones was our pastor in the Garda. Brother Courtney Wilson was holding the revival. And I would say, life has been better ever since. And friends, uh, I can't tell you how many people I have influence on my life over the years. Preachers, church people, uh, our Sunday school teachers. I remember Miss Hackett, a school teacher, and uh, the Wright brothers were school te uh, Sunday school teachers and all that. Brother Larry and I started serving on the maintenance committee at church for a long time, and we helped build additions onto the old church. I was lucky enough, my son built this, and I got to work here. I've been blessed. I mean, blessed. And uh, I just want to thank you for the blessing that since, well, I guess since the virus is gene of the virus, same time I did. And Jean has not recovered. Pray for her. I'll be alone. I've been blessed. I got good kids. They're all working. I've never had to go to jail and get none of them out and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> but man, that's worth a whole lot. And Brother Joe Estes and Brother Hackett back there and Jean Bowers and I'll be 87 years old the first day of August. They will be the oldest members here. Is that a blessing from God? Amen. Absolutely. Amen. And my prayer is that you will teach your kids and you will try to be a positive thinker and worker and, and whatever you go about at home, at church, work, wherever. There's so much negative, negativism in our society. It's terrible. But you know America is on a downhill slide. Only God... Uh, the, the 
president and another bless them can strike it out, but God can. I just want to thank you all for what y'all have done for us. Uh, people that brought food, that visited and called, and old Pappy likes that. <laughs> I've got some awful good banana puddings and things, so. But I just want to thank you, and I, I'm glad to be a part of, I'm not ashamed to be a part of the God of Baptist Church, and I look forward to the days ahead, and I thank this man right here, and all the pastors, so many people. You know, we don't realize that I, I had the privilege of teaching some young boys, sons, and I tried to tell them and teach them that every word you speak, every act you do, is a consequence. And we need to think about this. Everything I do and everything I say, the look I give, that's a kind of, people realize that. You know, people want to be wanted, and we, we need to do that. And I'm going to say something else, and I'll hush. Uh, we had a man come here, well, I don't know, he's not here today, I don't think, but anyway, I, we were back there, and I got up and I was talking to him, and he was from Hendersonville, I believe, and he uh, had been uh, coming up here a couple, two or three times, and I, I went to him, talked to him, told him who it was, asked him to fill out a uh, form for the visit. And he said, you know, he said, I've been visiting three or four churches, and you're the first person to welcome me to church. He wanted you to fill out a form and, you know, what, what, what can we do for you? So we need to reach out and we need to touch people. We may need to make a difference. Yes. Sometimes we may have to buy our own stuff and, you know, not get what we want done and everything else. But anyway, God bless. I love all of you. And uh, thank you. charge didn't cost you anything. <laughs> but I just want to say this. I'm a little upset at the moment because Happy had banana pudding. I don't know what to be upset with him because he didn't call me to share it. He didn't bring me in. So, but I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness of that and go on. Put it you get to the Oh, what I have to say is not near as important as what Pat just said, but I'll go ahead and uh, try to follow that up. Um, so uh, the announcements this morning... Um, just uh, remember, Wednesday night, we're doing our, um, our new series. We started it last Wednesday. The ones that were here, I think, got a lot out of that. It was a very good uh, first lesson and, and devotion there. Uh, Pastor James will be leading the discussion this Wednesday night. Uh, we'll watch another video. It's on suicide and depression. Uh, it's pretty in-depth, and it goes through a lot of different things that we don't always think about. It went through a lot of stats and things that opened our eyes last week. And so we're going to continue to learn what does God's Word say about those issues, not only for our own lives, but also in our community around us. We have a lot of people that are struggling with depression and anxiety. Um, I think right now 33% of people in the U.S. claim they have an anxiety disorder. It's probably more than that. And so when you're reaching out to the lost world around us, this is going to be a really prevalent issue. So knowing how to approach that, how to talk to people, how to pray with them, and how to point them ultimately to Jesus is a big deal. So I'd encourage you guys to come this Wednesday night, 6.30. Uh, we'll have a great time. Uh, we're all together here in the sanctuary this Wednesday and for the next few weeks. Also, if you have a key to the building, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back there. Put your key number down and your name. We're getting new keys, updating our locks. We want to make sure we get enough keys for everybody and get the right keys to the right people. Uh, July 16th, you've seen your bulletin there. we got our men's fellowship breakfast. It's 7.30 a.m. at Cracker Barrel in Gallatin. Uh, we did one uh, probably about a month or two ago here. Uh, it was a great time. We really enjoyed that. And so if you, have, if you didn't make it for that one, please come to this one. It's a good time with just fellowship. There's no agenda. We just come, get together, hang out, eat breakfast together, uh, and just really connect with one another. So if you're a man in the church, I'd encourage you to be there 7.30, July 16th. And then just two things real quick. Uh, the Wilson County Baptist Mission Opportunity, Pastor James already touched on that. But if you want to help in that, if you're a man in the church and you, you feel called to do that and have some time, please get with him on that. The more men, the better on that. Uh, also, a, uh, September the 10th is our FBS. We've been talking about this the last few weeks. It's our fall Bible school. Uh, and so instead of um, BBS, it's FBS this year. 
Kerry Brown is leading that charge. It's going to be one day, uh, several hours long, of just all kinds of activities poured into the children in the community. We're going to try to have some things for the young adults uh, and even the adults as well. So it'll be a huge community outreach event, one of the biggest ones we've done uh, in a while. And so we're really looking for all hands on deck on that. If, you, if you're available that day and you can help in a certain way, please get with Kerry. She'll put you in a certain spot. I think she wanted to make an announcement regarding that. Is she here today or she in the nurse? Let me see. She see if she can get her. I know she has more details than I do, so <laughs> I will get yeah, back there. <laughs> you wanna make an announcement on FBS or I'm sorry. <laughs> Speaking of the children. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, that could have been more perfect. Uh, <laughs> that is. <laughs> I couldn't have queued that up better. Okay. Um, last thing here is um, uh, we scheduled um, a few months back uh, two kind of soccer matches to go to for our youth. We did one uh, May the 1st. It was a good time. We had several youth that went. Uh, we have another one scheduled uh, for about mid-July. Um, here in about two and a half weeks, I'll put a uh, 17. Okay, I, I wasn't sure the exact day of what I had. July 17th, um, we have 20 tickets that are available. Uh, they'll be $20 a ticket. I'll just kind of open it up to the whole church. I know we've had a few youth leave, and I saw a lot of the parents wanted to go last time. We didn't have no spots. So we have about 10 extra spots this time than we had last time. So if you would like to go with your, with your child or you just want to go and hang out with us, uh, it'll be July 17th. I'll put a sign-up sheet in the back starting on Wednesday. Again, it's only $20 to go. It's really cheap. Uh, I got a good rate on these a few months back. And so uh, if you want to go to the soccer game, July 17th, that would be kind of a fun, cool outreach event for our church. And the ones that went last time, I can tell you, there's a lot of fun. Uh, those fans get pretty into it, so they're pretty excited there. Um, and lastly, uh, just as we conclude, uh, Pam, do you want to make any announcements in the ladies' conference? I know it's in the bulletin. Thank you. All righty. Can our ushers come up for the morning offering? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jason, you want to pray for us this morning?
Thank you.